So our next speaker is Liz Heller from University of Pennsylvania. And I think what Gavin said earlier, a lot of our efforts are to raise Syngap, more Syngap, in the, uh, to reverse the haploinsufficiency. And so we already heard from Ed and um, Jeff this morning and Gavin um, using a variety of different techniques, using uh, anti-centologos, um, AAV uh, delivery systems, novel systems like Jeff has developed to increase the expression of Syngap. And I think this is really the key um, primary um, way we're really going to have uh, developed therapies. And um, so today, Liz is going to tell about an another technique, and that's using epigenetic approaches to regulate expression of, of Syngap. So. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. And thanks, everyone, for having me. It's a pleasure to be at my first Syngap conference. Um, I'll start with a little personal anecdote. This is my niece, Ruby, um, at my wedding when she was seven. And I just love this photo. I do have an updated one because she's now 16. And um, actually, I, I've studied neuro, you know, neurobiology for a very long time, but I've only studied Syngap since 2020. And that resulted from Gavin meeting Ruby's dad, my brother, at this meeting uh, in 2016, and then making the connection that I was Ruby's aunt and also a neuroscientist. So a couple of years ago, I was fortunate that Gavin connected me with uh, Mike Gralia and the um, Syngap Research Foundation so that we could apply some of our um, knowledge and methodologies to, to this very important gene. So today I'd like to tell you about some of our approaches to um, interrogating the way genes work in the brain. So we'll start with everything, something that everyone in this room is familiar with, which is the central dogma. And in this dogma, we know that we have the double-stranded DNA helix, which codes for RNA, and that, that RNA then codes for protein, and we heard about that very beautifully today from Dr. Kohler and others. And in our Syngap kids, um, one of these Syngap alleles has a variant, and that variant causes there to be less RNA transcribed, and as a result, less protein. And I only wish that it was this simplistic looking inside of the actual cell, um, but of course it's not. And so one of the tools that I'm going to talk about today is shown simply here. It's called a CRISPR activator. You may have heard of CRISPR and Cas9 for deleting or mutating genes or even changing the genome of cells, animals, and people. But we can actually um, use an engineered version of the CRISPR tool that doesn't cut the genome or change the sequence, but rather can bring um, a gene regulator to a site of interest. So in this picture, you see the DCAS9, it's dead enzyme because it can't cut the genome. It brings this activator, VP64, over to the start site of the Syngap gene. And when it does that, then that Syngap gene will make more copies of the RNA because we've sort of tuned it up. We've turned up the volume with the CRISPR activator and more protein. This is one of the strategies that we use in the lab in brains and animals in a, several different models. And the goal now is to apply it to Syngap. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing we need to know is that that DNA is not naked inside of the nucleus. It never exists in that pretty picture of a double helix. Actually, it's in an extremely complicated structure called the chromosomes. And maybe you remember this type of structure from karyotyping in biology many years ago. Um, but it's a structure that allows the whole genome, two meters of DNA, so you know, almost the stage, to fit inside a nucleus that is only a few micron, micrometers, so millions, millions, <laughs> millions of a meter. How does it fit in there? It's actually an amazing feat of engineering by evolutionary time and mother nature to compress DNA into a structure so compact. We can't do that. Our species hasn't figured out that level of compaction. And in doing that, the DNA ends up getting wound first around a structure called a nucleosome. That's shown here. The DNA gets wrapped twice. The helix gets wrapped twice around this structure. It's got eight proteins in it. And then those protein structures, the nucleosomes, get in increasing levels of condensation until they can fit inside the nucleus. But what's important 
is that the DNA, when it's wrapped around this nucleosome, can be extensively regulated. The proteins that the DNA is wrapped around can be modified, and those modifications affect how well or how often the DNA is read and turned into RNA and protein. These modifications, there's hundreds of them, they're regulated across development, they're regulated by the environment, and they allow our brain to interpret environmental signals and turn those signals into changes in gene expression, or to interpret signals across development, as Gavin was just telling us, so that certain, um, at times of development, Syngap gets turned on. But importantly, we can manipulate the epigenome using CRISPR tools to maybe get access to some of these regulations. And in terms of thinking about therapeutics, I'll talk to you a little bit about CRISPR as a possible therapeutic. But no matter what strategy we end up with, our first strategy will probably not be our last strategy. And in improving drug approaches to this disease and others, it's really important that we understand how the gene is naturally regulated. So that when we run into roadblocks with a particular Syngap activator, we have a sense of what might be some of the strategies to improve the efficacy of those tools by understanding how the gene is naturally turned on or off. And we don't know that yet for Syngap despite all the knowledge we have about how the protein works, but we're getting there. So f one of the first things that we did in the lab, this is postdoc Shuo Zhang, who um, he's just been promoted within Penn, so hopefully he'll stick with us and we'll keep working on this. It was the first postdoc funded by Syngap Research Foundation in the lab. And the first thing that Shuo did was to interrogate um, existing data sets of the human and mouse genome for some hallmarks of those epigenetic modifications at the gene. So here's a little bit of data. So, you know, that's a pretty picture of the histone complex, but then the raw data look a little bit more like this. And what's on the left here are some of those modifications to the nucleosome that I showed in the previous schematic. And what you can see, you know, using this schematic is that we have this Syngap gene here, and these are the enrichments of those different types of modifications at the Syngap gene in the human and in the mouse. And this part highlighted in red is that transcription start site that's come up a few times in our session today and in others, which is the, you know, the part of the gene where the gene gets turned on, starts transcription and translation. And that part, the promoter, promotes gene expression, has particular histone modifications that tell the transcriptional apparatus, here I am, start transcribing me at this locus, and actually opens up the DNA so that it's not so tightly bound in that really condensed structure. The key thing here to take away is that we can target this promoter region which doesn't contain Syngap um, haploinsufficiency related mutations. The coding region, the exons, and we talked, uh, several people have talked about how mutations in different parts of the gene affect the severity of the disease, but there aren't mutations in this regulatory region that seem to cause Syngap. So that means that all of the, the patients have the same sequence here. So when we target it, we can have a tool that is uh, mutation or variant agnostic. Importantly, some of these um, epigenetic features are conserved across both mouse and human, so when we test our tools in mice, we can um, hopefully more easily adapt them to human cells and maybe someday people. So here's Ruby a little bit older, and I just highlight where her particular variant is, um, and she's 16 now, so I, I just can't even look at pictures of her. She's too big, and I just want to look at the baby pictures, um, but she's very lovely, and um, I adore her. So. so again, zooming in a little bit on the epigenetic landscape of mouse Syngap-1. So now we're a little bit easier to see here. And some of the tools, some of the target cells that we'll use when we want to test if our CRISPR tool can turn up the volume of Syngap-1, we look in cells, for example, and you see that in this cell line, this is neuroblastoma, just a cell line that we can use in vitro in the lab, also has this activating histone modification at the start of the gene, as well as in excitatory neurons that we derived from mouse brains. Over here, we see the gene expression. So this is actually the orange is showing you how much RNA there is. And what is important to note is that you see the RNA where you have the gene exons, and you see the histone modifications where you see the information for the gene to start. 
And we've talked today about how there are more than one start for this gene, right? There were the ABC isoforms. That has to do with different start sites. And you can identify here that there might be histone modifications that tell the transcriptional um, apparatus where to start coding for the different isoforms. So there might even be a way for us to target using a CRISPR tool um, activation from different sites. And what we're hearing, you know, from um, Gavin's work, for example, is that different isoform expression may have different therapeutic benefit. So that's another type of specificity that we can get using a CRISPR activator. This, oh, I could have clicked before. <laughs> so this is the start for the SYNGAP A, SYNGAP B, and SYNGAP C. Um, and so you can see some of the hallmarks of the epigenome that might indicate where to start coding for the different isoforms. One of the things that we do in the lab is study um, drug addiction and depression. That's actually the main thrust of my research throughout my career. And so we have a lot of tissue in the lab from animals that were treated with cocaine, which is a psychostimulant, and it greatly activates um, synaptic activity and gene expression. And so what, you're, what you can see here, although actually schematized, it's a little difficult to appreciate. We just thought to look if we can use our existing data to tell anything about how neuronal activity activates syngap isoform expression. It's not that easy to see, but if you take the cocaine condition just as a hyperactivated neuron condition, you can see a little bit that after cocaine treatment, the difference between this uh, middle exon and this later exon, this ratio is very different than the ratio after a month um, after cocaine treatment, which tells us that during the activation period, you have an effect on the ratio of different isoforms, and more importantly, that we can capture that effect in our existing mouse model. This is an endogenous measure of activation. It's a particular tool for neuronal excitability, but it's happening in the brain in vivo, which is very valuable for our ability to interpret the effects of our CRISPR tools. So we know that when we activate neurons with one form of activation, we can measure isoform expression. We can also interrogate existing data of how different isoforms are expressed across different brain regions. I probably should have reviewed Gavin's papers before showing this slide, but, but I, I, I failed to do so. But the, the main, the key point here is that we believe, as, as Gavin beautifully articulated, that there's actually cell type specificity and even neuronal region specificity to these different isoforms. That might be very, very relevant to therapeutic strategies. So again, using bioinformatic tools, we can start to capture where different isoforms might be expressed in a neuronal subtype specific way. We can then couple that to activation by different CRISPR tools. And you can imagine a situation where maybe one tool activated an isoform in one cell type and another isoform was activated by a different CRISPR tool in a different cell type. That may be just for understanding the disease, not necessarily for clinical therapeutic application, but those tools will be really important. It's possible that we only really need to correct a particular isoform in a particular brain region in order to rescue a big part of the syndrome. So understanding that specific biology may be really, really valuable. So those are some examples of how we're starting to interrogate the epigenetic landscape of this gene using data from my lab from the mice in my lab, from human data sets that are extant in, the, in literature. And we also have a strategy with Molly Riley, who is a very talented new postdoc in the lab. Molly actually um, won the Penn Hartwell Fellowship recently, which might not mean much to this audience, but she's like the only one postdoc that Penn gives this award to. So she's, she's really great for our community, I think, and she's a very dedicated developmental biologist. So. She sadly couldn't be here this weekend, but she will be with you guys soon. So Molly has taken the reins of developing CRISPR tools to activate specifically SYNGAP1. So I'll tell you a little bit more about those approaches now. So earlier I explained that these histones have modifications. Those modifications are not gene specific. So they're all over the whole genome and every gene in the, in the brain, in the nucleus. And if we want to use one of those modifications to regulate a gene's expression, we've got to target it. There are drugs that will change the histones across the whole genome, but that's not really the kind of drug we want when we're only trying to change expression of one particular gene, Syngap. 
So we use a different approach. I mentioned CRISPR tools, but there's actually a few different ways to target um, epigenetic editors. In fact, I think, is your rat is made from ZFN, right? Is that right, Dr. Till? Yeah, so um, in order to change the epigenome at a particular gene, we use a tool. These are three types of tool. They all have a couple of things in common. First, we have an engineered DNA binding domain. So that means we have like a synthetic, customized DNA binding domain that can recognize a specific stretch of the mouse or human genome. And then we also f we fuse that DNA binding domain to an effector domain. This is gonna be an enzyme that activates transcription or regulates the epigenome. I mention the tools here because for those of us interested in clinical applications of these tools, it's unclear yet whether uh, CRISPR will actually be the lead in clinic. And the reason is that these two tools, zinc fingers and tails, use a protein DNA recognition motif, and they're in mammals. These are natural mammalian proteins. In fact, the zinc finger is the most common protein DNA binding type in all of mammalian cells. So that means that our cells are very good at using a protein like this to find a particular spot on the genome. CRISPR is also very, very effective, but it developed in bacteria in response to viral genomes. So actually, it might not be that effective in interrogating the human genome or the mouse genome, which is much more complex. And it also, there's some indications that it may be, um, you know, causing some immunological response. So as people that use CRISPR tools are moving these things in the clinic, there's a lot of companies for all of these tools. Um, keep an eye out for which of these actually end up coming to clinic first. I've used all of them in my work, but today I'm gonna focus mostly on the CRISPR DCAS9 tool. In this case, it's not a protein that recognizes the DNA, it's a guide RNA. RNAs are way easier to design than proteins, and so these are really, really effective as tools in the lab. Here are a couple of examples of beautiful studies in the neurodevelopmental disease space that have used CRISPR-based epigenetic editing or activation to target genes that we know are implicated in neuro neurodevelopmental disease. I will have a paper like this soon, <laughs> but right now, most of my work um, is in psychiatric disease, so most of the papers that use epigenetic editing in the brain are actually coming from studies of depression and addiction from my work and a couple of others. But there are two really great studies from the Broccoli Lab and from the Yanish Lab targeting um, SCN1A and also um, the FMR1 gene. And we see that there's an effect of manipulating one gene on the whole entire animal's behavior and in these studies also on synaptic excitability. So that's really powerful. It means that we can have specificity of our approach and also holistic effect on the organism. So far in the lab, we have designed five different guide RNAs to target this regulatory region of SYNGAP1 using some of the hallmarks of the natural regulation of the gene as well as the location upstream. There are some limitations on where you can target your CRISPR tool. There are some endogenous features of the genome. There's also the matter of specificity. You want to target a locus that's only present once in the animal. So these were the, our first uh, tools. Um, they did not work, which is why I do not have data for you showing that they activate SYNGAP1. But you know, what? one of the things that's really important in research is to fail fast. Actually, our first tools never work. There's a lot of choices. I'm glad that, that you guys appreciate that. Um, so you, you just want to churn. You know, you have to churn because your first, your first experiments are not your last experiments, and they never are. So what this means is that we now have five negative controls, also very valuable. Um, and the next steps, Molly has made actually a, a, a much larger suite with a slightly different design um, approach. So these first guides, we prioritize their specificity and they were not very effective. In the second group of guides, we prioritize efficacy, like the likelihood that they actually activate the gene over their perceived specificity. Not that they're not specific, but in terms of the relative score. So now what Molly is doing and has done is to target, um, to package all of those tools into lentivirus. Lentivirus are not therapeutic viruses, but they are really valuable tools in a, in a mouse model in the lab. So what we will do is 
this first part were, is in progress. Then we develop our epigenetic activator or just transcriptional activator, package that into a virus. And then we can express that in three different um, preparations. So one of them is just in vitro in a cell line. This is where we would have those neuro 2 a cells. It's really valuable screening tool because it's relatively high throughput and the cells are cheap and off the shelf. Do they, do our tools activate SYNGAP1 mRNA and protein in these cells? Yes or no. A negative result in these cells is not that valuable because this is not brain. Then we have a second line of research, which is ex vivo. This is when we take neurons out of a mouse brain, actually an in utero mouse, and culture them. So now we have neurons in a dish, higher throughput than an animal, um, and can tell us a lot about the physiology that is affected by activating SYNGAP1 mRNA and protein without having to do in vivo electrophysiology, which is much more challenging. Third, and this is in a collaboration with Dr. Huguenier, we can put these tools into a mouse brain in vivo. We do this in a, the way that we do this is actually with an intracranial injection. So we target a specific brain region with a surgical injection to a particular site in the brain. Um, you can use um, these in, intrathecal <laughs> and other methods. Uh, I don't do that, but it's possible. For now, we go intracranial with our tools. The mouse that we're targeting is either a natural wild type mouse to see if we can activate expression above baseline. Maybe the animals will get smarter. That's one of the pieces of data we saw today. But even more valuable than that is to use these tools in an animal model of human disease in collaboration with, with Dr. Huguenier. We have one of those mice. They breed beautifully, so credit to, to the Huguenier lab for that. Um, and they're breeding faster than Molly can package the viruses, actually, so we've got to kind of catch up. And then we can examine not only the expression of SYNGAP, but also the animal behavior that we saw from, from Dr. Chell and Dr. Rumba earlier. The cultured neurons can also come from the mouse model of disease and their wild type litter mates. We really appreciate that these um, heterozygous animals, we can get really nice controls where siblings, some have the SYNGAP1 uh, variant and others are wild type, and we can directly compare phenotypes in those um, two animals or neurons from those two animals. It helps us to capture subtle effects that maybe wouldn't be available to detect otherwise. Um, sorry, that's kind of redundant. So um, before I wrap up, I want to um, revisit this idea that um, the nervous system is extremely heterogeneous. So one of the reasons I think that you know neurological disorders are so difficult to cure is because it's not a system where you can just treat the organ and all of the cells or most of the cells will do their function. In fact, most of the cells in the brain are not even the neurons that express the syngap, they're, they're glia. And so, one of the key things that we do on our lab is target our tools to neurons, but one of the essential uh, next steps is to actually analyze the epigenome of SYNGAP in particular cell types and neuronal subpopulations, and then to express our epi-editing tools also in those cell types. Without that, you could end up you know, causing more of a disease by mis-expressing an isoform or the whole protein in a set, set of cells that don't want that much or um, you could miss your target. So first step is just to interrogate the epigenetic landscape in specific cell types. This is not trivial. Um, it's really a matter of material. You need a lot of biochemical stuff, you know, biological stuff to actually measure those histone modifications. So this is a protocol that we've developed over the last year. It's recently accepted, but you can find it on the archive. In this model, um, we can basically isolate specific neuronal subtypes in the brain using some genetic tricks and then measure um, the different epigenetic modifications only in those subtypes along with the gene expression only in those subtypes. And that will help us determine if we expect an epigenetic editor to work in that subtype or not. We can also then target epigenetic editors only to specific neuronal subtypes using some of the same tricks that Gavin used for turning on SYNGAP1, rescuing it in only particular subtypes. Another complexity of using any type of tool, but CRISPR tools in particular, in 
in the body in general is delivery. So these are big, actually. I'm, I'm glad that we heard a little bit about CAS 13 um, today from Dr. Kohler, because it is a bit smaller. There are some smaller CRISPR tools, but right now they're too big to fit in AAV. So in order to um, get them into cells, we have to be a little bit more creative. And some of those approaches are shown here. This is also published, if you want to think about this a little bit more. AAV will only be amenable to different species of, of Cas9 that has smaller proteins. HSV is packaging limit is very, very high, but it only expresses for a little while. And then there are other methods, such as just transfection, which we do in the lab, or using a protein that can naturally penetrate through the lipid membrane, uh, or purified protein of the CRISPR-Cas9 ribonucleoprotein, so the RNA and the protein are together. Right now, in the lab, we're using lentivirus, which can package a very, very large amount of DNA and will integrate, so it's long-lasting, but these are not very clinically effective. So I think it's important that we educate ourselves about delivery methods when we think about the different tools. ASOs are phenomenal because you can just inject them. You don't even really have to package them. Peptides can sometimes be used that way. But some of these more different tools, maybe more specific tools or different approaches, um, may need different types of delivery methods. Lastly, I just want to mention some other tricks of the trade, which is that in terms of those cell type specificity, we also have temporal specificity. So we know that genes are not on all the time across development. They come on at very specific times, and then they can go off again. And that temporal specificity is also extremely important for the health of the animal and the cells. And so some of the things that you can do to kind of um, re-engineer the CRISPR tools is to engineer them in such a way that they are, um, have two components, and one of those components can be light activated. So in this little schematic, you can see that that effector domain, the enzyme, is actually not present on the CRISPR tool at all times, but in the presence of a particular wavelength at light, they come together, and then the CRISPR can do its thing. This is, again, this is not a therapeutic strategy, but it does allow us to have control over when we express and activate a gene. So those are some examples, and just our preliminary conclusions from starting this work is that we believe the SYNGAP1 epigenome is conserved from mice to humans. Um, CRISPR activation of SYNGAP1 may be sufficient to rescue SYNGAP1 haploinsufficiency, and that cell and region-specific CRISPR activation are necessary for specificity and efficacy. I forgot to mention, no, I didn't, I have a slide. Um, so this work is done in collaboration with um, several of the investigators shown here, including Ben Prosser and Bev Davidson, Ingo, who's, who's here with us today, and Deborah French. And one of the very, um, the strengths of this team for me is certainly learning about developmental biology from some of the world experts. But importantly, we also have access to human-derived um, neurons, you know, from human, uh, SYNGAP1 patient-derived fibroblasts, uh, turned into neurons, or INs, and we can also test our CRISPR tools inside of those human-derived cells. So that would mean a little bit of re-engineering, human and mouse genome are subtly different, um, but I think through our approach with uh, wild-type mice, model SYNGAP mice, and human um, disease tissue, we actually may be able to find a tool that um, is very efficacious uh, for phenotype. So with that, I'll just show the rest of the lab, and I'm happy to take any questions. Question. Great talk. Uh, I was just Thanks. curious with, if you were to come up with something that could change the chromatin architecture, the epigenetic modifications around the promoter, do you think you'd have to repeatedly dose, since these are relatively non-dividing cells? Yeah, it's a good question. So I will direct you to this review that is forthcoming. So it's a really good question. An, an essential question in using CRISPR toward the clinic is if we have a hit and run model for any of these targets, where we can sort of write the modification and then don't need to redose, because I failed to mention histone, Proteins are extremely stable. They're some of the most long-lasting proteins in the body, period. So they're very stable, and the modifications to them are, can also be extremely stable. So we can maybe get an effect without actually mutating the genome, which you know can be risky. So that's one of the things. Unfortunately, the, the studies, they never have a long time course. My behavioral studies are some of the ones that look 
past the peak of expression. Um, but that's exactly the right question, and that's the goal. And, and, and if that's the case, then you could introduce the therapy as an mRNA, right, and get around all of the other concerns of AAV and everything else. Yeah. I had another question. <laughs> I, I, I noticed on your, um, your uh, RNA-seq, was that a cut that was upstream of yeah. the promoter? Here? Yeah. I know what slide you're talking about. It's a weird, right? Here, right? You mean this one? Or yeah. up here? Upstream of the promoter. I thought I saw that there was a cryptic untranslated species. A oh. Cut. Maybe it's your nomenclature because you use cut. So I was just oh, cut A. That's what you're asking. Yes. Sorry. Cut A is an upstream gene. Actually, I'm glad you pointed that out because, well, I don't know where it is anymore. But so <laughs> one of the challenges, where is it? Because it's a nice question and it will help us think about this. One of the challenges of targeting the promoter region is that genes share promoter regions and cut A, I, I think I can't find the slide, of course, under pressure. Some of the promoter regions are shared. So in the Syngap locus, you have a promoter region that is between the Syngap gene going in one direction and the cut A gene going in the opposite direction. So if you activate from that promoter, you might get gene expression off of both of these genes. So actually, we use... Um, the histone modifications here, they have a bit of a shape that indicates there might be two separate K4 tri peaks, one for Syngap and one for um, cut A, but that's why the cut A is there. But I'm curious, is, it, is that a coding transcript? Or is it that is coding and it is, it is neuronal. <laughs> Would have been nice if it was just not real, but.